The Linmar School Board meeting will be called to order at 5 p.m. in the boardroom of the Learning Resource Center. Will you please determine a quorum? Oh, here. Eisenberg. Here. Lawson. Here. Morey. Here. Nelson. Here. Wall. Here. And Weaver. Quorum is present at 5 o'clock. Thank you. I make a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Second. Second. Go ahead. Mayor Britt, thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. <clears throat> For 300, I am opening a public hearing regarding the certified budget for the fiscal year 2022. Is there anyone to comment? Seeing no comments, I close the, the public hearing about the certified budget. Moving on, we have no audience communication today. So we'll move right into our blended learning update from Bowman Wood. Well, thank you to organize. We'll do a real quick welcome to the Bowman Wood staff. I know anytime we do a new in initiative, it's fun and exciting and challenging, but especially when we do it in the middle of a pandemic <laughs> um, as well. So big kudos to all of you for taking that on and continuing that through the crazy year it's been. So this is March and crew, it's all you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much, Ian and Kate Shaker, for presenting tonight the Bowman Wood School Organization. We really appreciate that. Um, I will start with introductions. Tina March, principal, Bowman Wood. I am Shanna Helmke. I'm the tech coach at uh, Novak and Bowman Wood. I'm Jen Fry, the instructional coach at Bowman Wood. I'm Carla Clannon, the media specialist at Bowman. And I'm Michelle Lake, first grade teacher. Oh. <laughs> See, the tech coach always messes it up. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard we're supposed to step to the microphone. You know, I don't like microphones, but I will do my best. <laughs> um, we have an amazing team here this evening, as you can see, representing Bowman Woods, and an equally amazing team in the school putting this all into practice. I'm going to kick us off tonight with our overview and timeline. That speaks for itself, and um, I'm actually speaking to the timeline piece. But before that, huge thank you to so many people in this room really that have supported us in this endeavor. Shannon, Nathan, Bob, Jerry, Carla Christian, Carla Reese, JT, to our board members for supporting us, and for all of you making that visit to our school in January. That, that meant so much to us to, to see our kiddos in action too. So for the background, the timeline, a couple years ago, I think I was in this very room when I heard about the possibility of STEAM schools, and I wanted it. And we were very fortunate, I, didn't, I don't think I twisted your arm, Shannon, to be selected to pursue this adventure along with Wilkins. Uh, coincidentally, we're both considered historical schools, which I happily <laughs> discovered actually means the building and not me. So that was, <laughs> I was happy about that. Um, we did ask for volunteers to serve on our theme school committee, and we were so fortunate to get a lot of people that wanted to volunteer and to pioneer this opportunity. So we were grateful for that. Uh, on this wonderful graphic you can see of our timeline, you notice that in February of 2019, teams from both schools got to visit Kenwood Leadership Academy and Johnson Steam Academy in the Cedar Rapids School District. And after these visits, Wilkins chose the leader in me path. And after a lot of spring brainstorming took place at Bowman Wood, we knew we wanted a theme really about students being future ready and really landed on a focus of PBL, project-based learning. Well, Teachers also had started dabbling in flexible seating to start the year of uh, fall of 2019 and saw the power that flexible seating really holds in keeping students engaged. We started a book study that summer. I had gotten all of the books, and Nathan approved that on PBL, project-based learning. And that book was so powerful in helping us decide very quickly that PBL was an ultimate destination and not where we needed to start. So that was not a waste of money, JT. It actually really helped us, and we will get back to that, okay? We will definitely get back to that book. So we regrouped, and this group, our whole committee read a variety of books, and all the staff in school articles pulled together by our fabulous leaders, and the theme of innovation was born. We continued to move forward with the team, splitting for visits to innovative schools in Clive and North Liberty in January and February of 2020. We came back with such amazing, wonderful ideas and put those into practice and held our first Pineapple Day in March, early March of 2020. And that's where 
teachers are willing to open their rooms and they get a special decoration of a pineapple to put outside the room and then staff members can sign up for times to visit all throughout the day. So that was very exciting. And uh, it was so incredible. And then, now remember, March of 2020, guess what? <laughs> yes, COVID. But did that stop us? No, that did not stop us. You will see what has happened this year with the year starting with a very powerful workshop for all staff led by Marsha Kish, a blended learning expert and guru. She is amazing. Her enthusiasm really powered us through as she gave us option after option, how to make this theme work in an environment affected by COVID. Because it is all about flexible seating, collaboration, <laughs> and so many things that we have had to be very creative this year. We've held review days, meetings throughout the year, and held our second annual Pineapple Day last week followed by a second remarkable workshop with Marsha Kiss last Friday. And I have to say, JT, she loved us so much that <laughs> she is giving us a free day of coaching next year. She's, she really appreciated our input, so that was <laughs> wonderful. So I'm very, very proud of the team behind me and of our theme committee and of our whole staff, really, for everything else, the, all of the obstacles they've had to overcome this year and the new learning, that they have still made the time to make our theme learning a priority. And I'm gonna hand the baton to Carla now. <laughs> so when uh, we first started talking with staff about what exactly do you enjoy about teaching and seeing in your students and how they, and what they can accomplish. And when we see our students most excited about coming to school, when are those times? And what do we exactly want for our students? And we did some brainstorming and thinking with our um, theme committee right at the beginning. And we came up, we did some tools that helped us brainstorm and we, we really leaned towards those four C's, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, and communication. And it was just blatantly out there for us. And that's, I think, how through our conversations, we really landed on innovation being that driving force for our school. That's what we wanted to see teaching and learning at Bowman Woods surrounding. So we came up with the theme of innovation. And then um, this summer and into fall, we're going to use George Kyrgios's book called The um, Innovator's Mindset because it's just really setting our mindset into what we will believe, what we will do with students. And this quote, innovation, it is something that is both new and better. Innovation is not about the stuff, but about the way of thinking. Innovation is about a mindset more than anything. And I think that's um, really what we want to have our school surround and feel and our students. Um, Going on with this, leading innovative change is kind of taking on four things. Um, we have that leading first, technology second kind of theme, where we have to have the things that we want students to learn first, and then we tie in the technology to that. Schools can no longer let the tail wag the dog. We need to really have our plan first, and then fit the technology and the innovation in with it. And not all innovative thinking is technology. So that's something else that I think has come up with Marsha Kish and our blended learning. Um, narrowing the focus is number two, and that is doing less can it actually make you better. We have so many initiatives. The classroom teachers have so many things that take their focus. And if we can at Bowman really focus on this is our goal we want students to have. How are we going to be innovative and in getting them there? That's what it's about. The third one is a new staff experience. So we know that we learn by doing things. So teachers are the same, students are the same. We need to learn by experiencing what other classrooms are doing, what other schools are doing, um, either through videos, through readings, through visits. Uh, the pineapple days are wonderful where we can just go see our colleagues and what are they doing and how is it different. And then fourth, embracing an open culture, being those leaders that open our doors so that everybody can come and see what we're doing. And that is um, excellence should not be hidden. So at Bowman Woods, we need to invite that. 
With all of these things, I've created a graphic for our school that kind of ties in Marsha Kish's phases one, two, and three that Bowman Woods will be going through. And um, you can see in the graphic, the four C's are actually driving that innovation bus throughout the journey up the hill. And we're tying in blended learning, we're tying in STEAM learning, and we're moving through those phases one, two, and three to reach the top of our goal. And our goal is really student achievement and engagement. So we wanna see those high and mighty at the top and we will get there. You'll see the hiker kind of um, headed for that all aboard leader. That's about year two, which will be next year when we hope more of our staff will hop on board and be leaders to lead the motion of innovation through Bowman Woods. Thank you, Carla. So I will tell you just a little bit more about the what and the why of blended learning. First of all, what is it? Um, it's really truly a combination of bringing in engaged learning online, but combining it with opportunities for kids to also learn in offline opportunities. So it's not necessarily something where they are on their computers all the time. It's really finding those innovative ways to help harness that technology and help them create new products that maybe um, they have never seen before. Um, it provides students um, control over what they're doing. They are able to um, have say so in the pace that they cover the material, the place in the classroom where they might be working, or even the path of their own learning. So there's lots of facets where the students have choice in what they're doing, both, like I said, learning online and combining it with active, engaged learning offline. So why is this such a powerful um, practice that we are putting into place with our innovative school? It really truly does empower students. And as you will see in here, we'll be hearing from um, Michelle Lake, a teacher here in just a minute, about what this really looks like in action. I know some of you got to see it when the school board visited a couple of months ago. But students truly do work at their own pace, which increases their motivation and their engagement. And when students are more engaged, it really increases their confidence in their learning and ultimately could result in increased test scores even um, because students are so engaged in their learning and they're motivated to get that work done. It's also empowering for teachers. Um, we just had a great uh, session again with Marcia Kish on Friday and really truly it's more of the teacher being the guide on the side and less of the teacher just in front of the classroom on stage teaching the students directly all the time. There's a lot of creativity involved with their lesson planning and the lesson design. And the goal is to pull out those innovative ways to get students working together and still reach those standards of learning. Ultimately, by that increased engagement too, it does decrease um, classroom behaviors because students are more engaged and working together and collaboratively. So there's lots of whys for blended learning for teachers and students. <coughs> Thank you, Jen. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about, so you heard the three phases and you're probably like, what are the three phases? So Marsha Kish, um, who like Tina March mentioned earlier, is the guru to blended learning. Um, and so she has the three phases of blended learning. So the phase one is considered the training wheels of blended learning. So this is where we kind of start to redesign that learning space with the more flexible seating, um, we're breaking the lesson into four parts. So now you have a mini lesson, you have a independent studio, a digital studio, and then future ready, which works on those four C's. Um, and then you're also using personalized technology to help meet the standards and help students meet those standards where they're at. So it's really cool, it's a great, um, like it says, kind of those training wheels of getting started with that process and kind of laying the foundation. Phase two is called the magic sauce of blended learning, um, mostly because we're using data now to drive our mini um, lessons. And so this is what Marsha Kish talked with us about on Friday, and you could just feel the energy kind of come back into the life of the teachers at Bowman Woods on Friday morning. Um, like 
Tina said Marcia Kish is amazing. She's very upbeat, and she, you can tell she loves what she does. So we really talked about using that data with the adaptive practice tools that you are using in your classroom and kind of grouping your students based on their needs. So we're working on that for our next steps for phase two. Um, and then phase three is really just that one small step from really becoming a personalized classroom where students um, now have the opportunity. They have a checklist that's differentiated for them. They're able to have more voice and choice in what they want to learn when they want to learn it. And inevitably, the student engagement increases so much. Kids are excited. They're like, do we get to do literacy today? Do we get to do math? And they're excited because they have that voice, that choice, the path, the place, and they get to pick the time of when they want to do that. So it really increases that engagement, which we know increases student achievement. So those are the three phases. Right now, we are getting started with phase one. That's kind of been what we've been doing this year. Um, and of course, the number one thing you have to do with phase one is change your learning environment. Well, with COVID, we weren't able to do that. However, we did have some teachers dabble in this the year before. Yes, math is hard for me. So you know what year I'm talking about. <laughs> but we had people doing the flexible seating. And here's pictures from first grade classrooms, um, third grade classrooms. You can see that the kids had options of where they wanted to sit. And it's comfortable options. However, we still know that teachers are the ones that are going to say, yep, that's a good spot for you. Nope, let's not do that. But um, that comes with the training. And so we're hoping next year we can get back to this learning environment because the kids are just craving that, that collaboration, being able to talk and being able to um, mix and kind of mingle with one another. And so the learning environment is very important to us and we know that that's kind of our next steps that we want to look forward to for next year. And I will give it to Michelle right now. Hi, thanks. All right, so I started with the blended learning about three years ago, right when we started at Bowman, and I love it. I feel like the students are so engaged that they want to get to work. They can't wait to start the rotation. So since I live it every day in reading and in math, I'm going to walk you through what those four um, parts of that rotation might look like. Um, so we start with the check, check, done. There's a variety of examples of what the student would see. Um, these can be linked into their Schoology page so they can quickly access the link. So if a student needs to get to their seesaw, they can click on that and it'll immediately go to their seesaw. They can complete the activity and submit it to their teacher. They can get to the digital options and then they receive a new check, check done every single week. Um, they also get one of these as a paper copy. As Marcia Kish said, that blend and learning is paper light. So we don't want a lot of papers around, but this is one that they really hold on to and then they keep it all week and then it keeps them accountable. Everybody likes to check something off when they're finished with it. It's like if you do one activity, you definitely want to mark it. So they're all about, okay, I got five squares colored today. I did all of my dots. So in this blended learning model, the checklist is broken down into the various stations that the teacher has chosen. So for first grade, that would be a mini lesson, Lexia, independent, digital, and future ready. I'll go into more detail of each of those on the next slide. Um, but I've seen these in use in a lot of different classrooms during the pineapple day. It was amazing, I went to a fourth grade class, I watched the student, he came over, he showed me his check, check done. He said, I'm gonna work on coding, da, da, da. Showed me everything he was doing, marked it off, he couldn't wait to explain to me what he was doing. I went to a third grade class and they were doing a, a look, block it, look it? Look it. Look it. Yep. And then I watched them, they were super engaged in math, and then later I saw one of those third grade students and he said, have you tried it with your class yet? <laughs> he could not <laughs> wait for me to go back to first grade and see how my kids liked it. So, you can see that they're loving it. They want to share their learning. They want to show you what they're doing and then have you try it. So a mini lesson is just possibly the best 15 minutes you get with a group because you teach 20 on the carpet and you hope you're getting to everybody. But when you have five, six at the table that are all at a specific level, you know that you're meeting their needs. This group is based off of data. They're fluid. So if you have somebody that's excelling, you can definitely move them. They're not set for the whole year. But you know at that point in time that you can get to reading standards, provide intervention, um, progress monitor, work on reading and writing skills. So these groups are leveled and they're focused. So you can do this for, for both reading and math. Um, so it's tru truly the best time of the day because you just have such a small group. You really get to know them and you know what they need. And instantly you can reteach something. So if you've taught a lesson on telling time and somebody just cannot quite get it, you can just revisit it with four kids 
and really get your hands on the clock that are touching things and really just fine tune your lessons. So I really think teachers love this time with their kids. So independent studios are activities that students can complete at their desk on their own. These could be on the computer, they could be paper pencil. They're gonna be reinforcing whatever you've already taught. Um, and students wouldn't need the teacher at this point in time. It could be an activity like a word store, sentence writing, activities on Seesaw, or even cross-curricular writing. Specifically, first grade has tied these to our word families. So students go on and they click on Seesaw. Immediately, once they complete the activity, they could record their voice on their telephone. So they have a little phone they plug into the side of their computer. They talk, and then they submit it to their parents. So parents instantly get to see their work, and they feel really good about it. Um, and parents respond then and can tell them, like, oh my gosh, great job, I love how you did your work today. And so there's a lot of that communication back and forth, which they really like. Um, digital learning provides choice for students for working on a computer program that supports learning. Some of these might include Freckle, Raz Kids, Epic. Students can listen to stories, read stories, and take quizzes. They're allowed to choose which digital activity they prefer. Um, and the expectation is that they choose different ones each day and then mark their list. Um, teachers can give specific lessons in Freckle. They can assign certain books in Raz Kids. In math, they can work on Freckle, Extra Math, Khan Academy, and Prodigy. So all of these, and you quickly learn what kids like the best. And it's interesting to ask them, which would you pick first? Which would, and it varies. Some love one program, some love another. It's also interesting to watch, um, now that I'm in phase two, some will go to digital first, and some will go to future ready first, and some are like, oh, I wanna get my hard stuff out of the way first. So it's just like if you're gonna eat a cupcake, are you gonna eat the bottom of the cupcake, or are you gonna eat the frosting first? Some kids always eat the frosting first. They need to pick all the fun activities, the crafts right at the beginning of the week, and others save those for Friday. So it's interesting to watch the kids progress through their list and decide what they wanna work on. And then the last option is Future Ready, and this is by far the kids' favorite. Um, they love that they get choices, they have hands-on learning, and they can work with a partner. So this is gonna look different across every grade level, but on your list, within your Future Ready, you have choices. So students have ownership, it allows them to pick something they're interested in. We did some animal research, then they wrote facts, then they created Google Slides, and then they were able to present those in front of the class. I think I had 16 out of my 20 present to the class. We recorded them on Seesaw, and then instantly their parents could watch them present. Kids would clap, and then they'd give them pointers. I love how you did this. I like how you added a picture. I ran into a parent at a sporting event, and she said, my son cannot stop doing Google Slides. He wants to do them at night. He wants to do them on the weekend. <laughs> they just loved it so much they couldn't get enough. Um, Future Ready can also include games, learning to take turns, doing puzzles, building, using the STEM boxes. Um, they're able to find facts on Kittle. We've done surveys. They can do culminating projects in classes. So I definitely think this is just that the best part of their day. And a lot of times we have the radial timer going, so they have 15 minutes to work in each station. And this one, they don't want to leave. They're actually upset that that work has to stop. It's not like, oh, I'm done. What do I do? They just want to keep working. They want to keep adding. They want to keep working with a partner. So um, they can also do things with Jamboard, Flipgrid, Kahoot. I see a lot of this just even talking to my own free girls at the dinner table. They'll talk about, oh, today I filled out a Jamboard and I did this. So I can see it across the district. People are using these things. And so it's just interesting to hear and then see how you can add them into your classroom because I definitely know just from experience in my room and then hearing other people how engaging this is for kids and how much they love. This is their future. I mean, they'll be on technology forever and they're so quick and they're problem solvers. And so I just love seeing it at Bowman Woods. It's been so fun to watch this process sort of unfold at Bowman Woods. We've used this visual to help sort of support what happens to student engagement when we work on blended learning. This is by Philip Schlechty. And you can see that it's really split out into two columns. So levels of engagement fall into two categories. You have to have attention and commitment. So Michelle's sharing just before this to help really illustrate when kiddos have high attention to the tasks that they're doing, they're really committed, they're excited to do the work. They don't wanna stop at that station time. And so that is what we're after, is really increasing that true level of engagement and, and pique the student's interest and attention and commitment to the work that they're doing um, in order to reach those high levels of engagement. So um, I will turn it over to Sam. Perfect. All right, and we know you guys were able to come to Bowman Woods in January, but we, have done a lot. Like we said in, with innovation, we're always changing, we're doing new things, and so we wanted to bring a little bit of Bowman Woods School of Innovation to you. 
Um, so please enjoy. The audio is a little hard to hear, so I might kind of say what the kids said since I've watched this video quite a few times. So <laughs> please enjoy. This morning we're starting our grow time with doing some research and I have some experts that are helping other friends learn how to make a Google slideshow of their research.
I love blended learning because it really engages my students. I also think that it is very interesting um, that we've been able to get the students involved in the process of deciding what they would like to add to their rotations. Um, By year four of this, because we're already in year one now, we hope to fully implement all of phase one and phase two in all subject areas, and then we'll be moving to phase three where appropriate for students. And so we, we just really appreciate having this opportunity to share this with you with, for all of your support, for this amazing team behind me, and also for all of the staff at Bowman Woods, because it truly does take a village, and this would not be happening without everybody's um, buy-in. And, and making it a reality. So thank you very much. Any questions? Anybody? <clears throat> thank you so much, all of you, for coming. We appreciate learning all about what's going on. And when they allow us to come back and hang out, we'll be there. <laughs> thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> move on to our next one, City Council. We have March 18th and the 8th of April. Um, is there a report for the 18th? Okay, seeing none. How about April 8th? I know some of you, we had some things going on the 8th, didn't we? About parking. Yeah, I can provide an update. Um, I'm not sure if the board member had one or not, but I can provide updates for part of that at least. Um, as I mentioned in Friday's communication with you, um, had some parking things were on their agenda. They had a lot of parking things on their agenda that night. We were just one or two of them, basically. Um, as you know, we made a request to the city um, to limit parking at dismissal and drop-off times at Wilkins um, from the area from the parking lot to McGowan. So it's a really small stretch where things were tending to bottleneck, especially in the wintertime when the streets would get narrower and cars would be uh, more frequent and buses as well. Uh, when the city came and looked at it, they I thought their recommendation was to extend that no parking area during dismissal and drop-off times from McGowan all the way to 23rd Street um, on the west side of McGowan. Um, and they had quite a discussion on that um, on the on the 8th during the city council meeting and ended up making that, re uh, accepted the city's recommendation and approved that. So um, that was not what we initially thought. Um, it'll definitely free up some traffic flow issues at Wilkins, but also create some other challenges uh, for some parking things there that we're working through with the city right now to figure out other alternatives. So, um, Other than that, was anything else on there of initial um, updates? The only other thing I saw that may eventually impact this is the city's in the process of changing parking. I see my streets right here from 10th Street to Elburnett all the way and from 29th Avenue to 33rd Avenue, um, I believe it is, or maybe they went all the way to um, Tower Terrace. We can only park on one side of the street, not the other. So high school parking eventually when we get to have all students back will be a little more limited off campus um, on um, that side of uh, the high school campus as well. So that was approved as well. And that was as far as I um, stayed for the meeting that night. So. Okay. Any questions? All right. So we'll move on to legislative update. Um, I'm not sure who wants to jump in on this one. Tim or Britt, if you want to go first at all or not, I know Britt did print off a 
have a copy of the, some bills that made it through funnel and some that did not. Um, everybody has a copy of that as well. So I'm going to go first. <laughs> What's that? So you made it to the second funnel, yes. um, which is when a bill has passed out of one side, but it doesn't come out of committee on the other. And if it doesn't make it out of committee, then it it's can't done. Be, it's done for the session, unless they add it on as an amendment to a different bill. Um, so I did uh, just kind of make an updated list of um, there were only a few bills that ended up as dead this time around, and then there's still some bills that are alive. And then I provided what I thought was a decent summary of Senate File 532, which is the, they've been amending that supplemental bill that they've been going back and forth on and whether or not we would get full funding or you know half day funding. Uh, so I kind of, I've included that so you know where the bill stands as of today. It hasn't passed yet, but it's making its way through and it's still alive. So, um, and it's looking better and better for us. Um, they don't have those um, uh, penalties in there that should be so oh, that's good. good. But other than that, um, we did we did continue to send uh, communication once the charter bill went over to the Senate. We updated our letter and sent that to the committee and then to the full Senate. They still haven't debated it yet. They keep pushing it back. It was supposed <laughs> to be on there last week twice, and it was supposed to be today. And as of leaving at 4.30, it wasn't debated yet. So um, that's kind of where it stands, and hopefully it'll just kind of keep getting a little quieter <laughs> the next few weeks. Sounds good. Was it, well, excuse me, was it my understanding <coughs> that on the charter schools, <coughs> what we're trying to accomplish is trying to be able to pull back some funding? Is that what I read? Or did I, you know, so not all the money would, would go from so our district to a charter school. We'd be able to pull some back. Initially, we were just an adamant no, and we still are an adamant no. But as it's moved, we said, well, if, if you're going to vote yes, could you amend it to, you know, address these holes? And one of the things that was asked is if a student gets kicked out or fails out or is removed from the changes charter, their mind, it doesn't want changes to their mind, that the funding then reverts back to the okay. public school that they should have originally attended. Okay. So that the charter school doesn't get to keep the funding if the student isn't there. That was one of the bullet points that, um, that UEN asked us to promote, and so we did that. It might have been what I read. Yeah. yeah. The other real knowledge to bring attention to, in addition to the ones that Britt mentioned, uh, the one tax policy change they're really trying to make this year, um, it's not specifically focused on schools, but there is an impact for us, the Pearl levy that we've talked about that we have in place in very few schools in Iowa do. I've seen 23, I've seen 28, I'm not quite sure what the number's right, but either way it's a, a small number, but um, the, to us that has to be a really unfortunate um, loss if it came to this, there's just no reason for it. Uh, one, it's not even a board appointed or a board, a board assigned levy. It is a voter approved levy. Um, and all of those funds go right back into your community. Um, I give you a list of things in fire communication from tennis courts to track that people can walk on to walking trails to playgrounds. Um, just a real direct impact on community as well. So if that does go through as it's currently proposed, the parole levy would be gone. And that's about a $300,000 revenue source for us for those type of projects. So. Um, I feel like that's an unfortunate sacrifice if it comes to that. How much did you say? Three hundred thousand dollars. Yes, yeah. on an annual basis. We got a nice email from IASB outlining some talking points on parole. If if you wanted to look at that email, you would have some some talking points if you wanted to communicate about that. We have not sent any communications about that specifically as a board. So. The tough one is not many schools in Iowa have it, so there's not many people advocating against removing Pearl, unfortunately. Um, so that's why we've tried to speak up to our um, individual um, lobbyists to help advocate for that as well. So. Is there a way to make that money back up some way or somewhere? It's a good question. I don't think there is. I'll look at JT for more clarification, <laughs> but not really, because we already have Pepple in place, so there really would not be a way to. Yeah, we would have to absorb all those projects that we have allocated. Are we, do we set those funds at all? Or do we have any well, we, we have the Pebble, um, but we, we have that already at the last meeting. Oh, okay. So we don't so have any new grants. Yeah, there's, there's okay. no room to increase that. Okay. In essence, it would be $300,000 of items we're not able to accomplish each year. Right. So that has to delay. Yep. Yeah, several things to keep you up to date. It's been a little while since we've met, so. Um, some updates for you. It wouldn't be right if we didn't start with some sort of COVID um, <laughs> update. And I'll keep that part very brief, thankfully. 
Um, vaccination, we've completed all of our vaccination um, clinics for the staff. Um, every staff that was interested in getting a vaccine has had that chance in both rounds. So we are fully vaccinated um, to our full capability. So that is fantastic news for us, um, for our staff. Um, our current COVID numbers um, are still in a really good spot. Um, we have seen some slight increases the last several weeks um, from our students, especially um, from number in quarantine, but we're still about one sixth of where we were in the winter months. So we're still in a much better spot than we um, have been at other times. And those numbers did go down this morning. So we're hoping that will um, kind of be an indicator of where things go as well. So, so overall, I feel very good about where we're at and very pleased um, with those numbers compared to where we've been at other times this year. So uh, two other things I want to keep you up to date on. Um, first one's the Facility Advisory Committee. As I mentioned a couple times, we're getting that committee organized and formed, sent out letters last week to um, individuals that um, have been nominated uh, or volunteered, kind of had a mixture of that uh, from different people um, from all walks of the district. Um, hearing back from most people, they're able to make that and they're excited to do that. So that's kind of fun to get organized and get started. I did give you a couple of documents in your area too. I won't walk through all these in great detail um, for you, but the you've probably seen a very similar document to this in the past. The, little trifold. Um, this is an updated version of this, so thank you to Mr. Fry for getting that put together. Um, we've had to drop off some of the things to get uh, things to fit, so now it goes from 2010 to the current um, spot. The sample letter that we sent to um, committee potential members is there for you as a reference as well. And the third document I left for you um, is our updated 10-year capital plan. Um, you all notice the date has changed at the top. It was originally October 2019 is the last time we've had a, a significant update to it. And what JT has done since that time is just updated what has actually taken place since then. We've not made any other changes on um, pri reprioritizing anything or adding new things to this list. That has not changed at all. Just getting up to date so when we um, start with this, this is where we will start with that committee is where is our, where have we been, where are we at, and then their work will be to help us figure out where do we want to go. Um, so this, these three items will be um, shared with the committee to start us out. Um, the goal for the committee, I'll be really clear, is I hope to have them by December or January bring back recommendations to the board um, for things to add or change on this 10-year capital plan. So that will be their, you know, their walking orders to do. They will not be getting into specific things on any project or any part of the detail thing that may come up on a building or in addition, that would come at a later time if the board approves it, and then we'd get more specific work on those areas. Um, so their work that they will start with was this document. We'll walk through what it means, what it looks like. And then we're also going to kind of combine that with, if you remember right back before COVID hit, we had spent some time with the board in a work session talking through um, items we wanted to see either amended to this document or added or changed on here as well. We did a similar activity with leadership team about a year and a half ago as well. So we've kept those items, compiled them into one list, and that will be the um, a starting point for that committee to look at and say, what about this item or this topic? Where does that fit on this plan in the priority order? Um, so that'll be the work of the committee to, to do. So um, it should be fun work, it should be exciting work to do, and really important work for us to know going forward um, where we're at. And the, I guess the rather really encouraging piece of this is we don't anticipate that um, the outcome of this will be the need for a bond. Uh, we think this is um, information and items we'll be able to address through Pearl that still exists, Pebble, and our one cent sales tax, our saved dollars as well. So it's more of a matter of how do we responsibly plan um, for the funds that we have available. So it's always nice to know that bonding should not be the, the end result. Um, just a reminder for you, our first committee meeting is May 17th. Um, look forward to updates um, with three board member reps on that committee um, as well. So Clark, Britt, and Sandra will be able to update the board as well as myself at each, after each meeting time too. So um, the one other thing that I wanted to just kind of plant the seed with you now, we'll revisit this next board meeting, is one of the things the board committed to right away is the commitment to one high school for the length of this capital improvement plan time frame. Um, the other thing we've talked about a little bit on the side has been, are there other non-negotiables or real priority areas the board really wants to emphasize before we hand this off to the committee to dig into? So just kind of be thinking that through um, a little bit too, and then we'll talk about that at the table um, next two board meetings before the committee meets as well. So um, plenty of options what that could look like. Um, 
kind of where does that balancing act where the board wants to set where they want the committee to to spend some time struggling with a little bit so that's the facility advisory committee last thing i'll give you a quick update on just a more fyi and for our public as well um, assuming this next item goes through for return to learn return to normal plans we would really like to do start opening up uh, for open houses at boulder peak and hazel point um, for first of all for the students and families to be able to see the buildings, the students have, but show off the building for their families. Um, and then the second round would be more of a public open house situation where we think we could safely spread things out as well. So uh, those are things we'd really like to see that, um, how that could look um, and share our new buildings with everybody as well. And we'll get community members excited to see what they supported in a bond vote several years ago. Uh, people are just really excited about those buildings as well. We obviously could not share that at the start of the school year. We think by the very end of the school year, we'll be able to do that in a safe way, after hours, with requirements, um, to keep things spread out too. So I'm excited for those opportunities, and we'll talk about, about that here in a few minutes. So, other questions on any of the things I mentioned? I didn't give you much time for follow-up on those. And are you the, are you the uh, quote, monitor? Do you run the um, facilities meeting, or who, who actually runs it? Yeah, it's going to be a joint effort between myself and OPN Architects. Um, we've met with them a couple times in planning out a, um, a journey for this. We meet with them again next Monday to kind of put the final details in place for that um, first meeting. Um, so we're working through the process. Um, kind of a joint effort on certain things I'll lead and other things I'll hand off to them to, to facilitate that meeting and conversation. Okay, on to review of our return to learn plan. Somewhere, I've got a lot of papers for you today. So somewhere in there should also be a copy of um, what we are suggesting for um, changes to our original return to learn plan. Um, as a cabinet group, we went through the original board approved return to learn document from, I don't know, it was August or September off the top of my head, but um, before the school year started. Um, and started looking at are there certain things we want to consider to uh, make some changes to for the rest of the school year um, as we enter the fourth quarter today. And there were a couple things that popped up for us as well. So the things that are listed there on that sheet, I won't read through all of them, um, but what you will see is some commonalities of really trying to protect that student day, um, especially. Uh, make sure the buildings are still um, very contained with the students and staff that need to be there um, and have that be the, the priority. But some of the more after hours things, we think there's a possibility to start opening some things up a little bit and start taking first steps in our um, journey to return to normal. Uh, those would include uh, some transition meetings for some students um, to go from building to building to help them prepare for next school year. Um, open houses at Boulder Peak and Hazel Point I mentioned after hours. Um, staff meetings we feel like those could be done, um, especially in certain buildings um, where they can spread out better as long as they follow other COVID guidelines we have in place as well. Um, individual meetings with parents um, as needed on your IEP meetings or just conversations sometimes. I think a lot of things have worked well via Zoom, very well in those situations, but certain times that individual conversation just goes better in person a lot of times, especially as we talk about transitions for kids from building to building next year, uh, just those type of um, conversations that are easier to have in person. So, um, And then there are two summer updates that we um, recommend making changes to as well to start um, transition this summer. Uh, some of the camps that we typically have offered that we have run as a district uh, for students would look to open up and then swim lessons would be the other one and the body and his staff at the aquatic center feel like they have a, a plan of how to do that safely and offer that as a next step as well um, so with that i will open up to any questions comments concerns thoughts you may have on um, initial steps to return to normal well a couple of questions that i have the first one is i'll just go down to the sports and music camp are masks going to be required in the facilities at that time you know, for the rest, of, that's a really good point. That's probably been the biggest question I've been getting lately from people is how long are we going to require masks? And my answer to everybody has been, um, I don't know, but we're going to err on the side of caution. And public health and CDC guidance um, still says masks are recommended for schools to require. Um, so we will still continue to follow that. So my thinking is, as of now, yes, we would say masks would be required during those time frames. Um, but I also know that things could change a lot the next couple months, so we may have to come back and revisit that again, but I guess I would err on the side of, yes, they're required until we're able to mm -hmm. either have recommendations from the experts or we're more confident that we're ready for that next step. 
I'd rather do that than say, no, they're not required, and then have to continue to say, oh, yeah, now they are again. So at I this point, I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Took a long answer to a very short <laughs> answer. Well, that's going to be a big question. That's you know, it okay. is. And that'll be a big question going into next fall, like you said. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's a great point, too, about next fall. There's just so many unknowns, what things are going to look like several months ahead. Um, so it'll definitely be a summertime topic for us to revisit as we get a better idea of where things stand in our community and how we want to start next school year. The good thing about the sports camps is they're a lot of them are like student led, right? And so our varsity athletes and our high school athletes are accustomed to this after their school year. And so it should be like a modeling thing that's easy for the littler kids that attend the camp. So hopefully it's a non issue. Not and I, I like the idea of we're still sticking with what we've done the whole time. We're following the CDC. We're listening to the public health officials. Um, and yeah, as more of the community is vaccinated, we can address those things as the guidelines tell us to. But I like sticking with that and not trying to go off on our own. Well, most kids, it's a, it's a routine now. Yeah. It's a habit. Yeah, it doesn't bother them as much as it bothers us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just what they know. So. Anyone else? Comments? Do you have another question? I, I do have a few more questions. <laughs> Going into the fourth quarter, maybe hopefully this isn't off track. The number of students that are still only doing online, do you have that number? And then of course going into the fall oh. as well. I do not have that number off the top of my head. I have some rough numbers for that, but I'd have to do some really quick math on that right now yeah. as far as numbers and, that are and that's not necessary. I just, um, the number has decreased since the start of the year. I don't know if anyone has a number off the top of his head on what we currently have um, as well. But as far as numbers for next school year, um, all we have right now is initial preliminary. Um, parents said they thought they would. They were thinking was they would intend to have their students still be online. Um, those numbers were somewhere in the 140 to 150 range, if I remember correctly. Um, but we've not had official sign up registration on that. Survey you did, right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. I, I just I don't know if it's a question, but I think you said opening it up, but they'll have to follow our COVID guidelines. I guess. I, I think you said that right. Correct. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So just. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. And, and you want that number, the district number? That'd be great. Cause <coughs> I, so uh, we do that. Gala runs that report for us at the end of each month. So this was on March 31st. So it doesn't take into account all of the families because they still had. I think they still had some time through that. So we may not have all those numbers captured for the students that just went back. But right now we have 1,572 kids online. So almost 1,600 still online. Yeah. Now that's probably gonna be a little bit less in the April numbers that we run because there were several that in, in the high school and middle school, even today and end of last week, we're still transitioning some kids back. Yeah, the high school had a busy day today of families requesting both directions, two hybrid, two online, two in person as well. So those numbers are still very much adjusting. Thanks, Megan, appreciate it. I remember we started at like 1,800, right? Online, about beginning of last year. Around that sounds roughly eight, correct, but I eight, don't yeah. quote me on that one. And so. we still have six periods? I wonder if some of those numbers, some of the hybrid numbers in the high school aren't counted in that number, because I think that's a little high as well. I'm okay, I guess I just have a quick question about that, which is, that, you know, I would have assumed based on the numbers you gave for um, people signing up or, or people saying they're thinking about online for next year yep. that we'd have, like, a lot more kids back to school at this point than that. I, I, is, that any, is that something we should be concerned about or well, do you know what I mean? I do. What I've heard from families and um, others can share what their experiences on this, too, is a lot of families struggle with that decision in the fourth quarter. Do we go back or do we stay? I heard from a lot of them is they felt like they were kind of ready to go back, but they also knew their child was in a comfortable spot, knew their teacher, split okay. their class, felt like they were doing well. So they I didn't want to make that right abrupt change in the late okay. school year. Yeah. That so I don't know okay. if that's what you're That's what I was going to say. I mean, we talked to Arthur in, for third quarter, and he said, I don't want a new teacher. I like my friends. I've got a routine. And I mean, for an eight-year-old to say, like, he had really – good reasons, and I've heard very similar things from the families that are in his, his class. His, I know we've had drops, but both of the sections for his teacher are still in the 20s. So I think we settled in for this year, but a lot of us are definitely coming back next year. Okay. So that's what I'm hearing. I've yeah. heard that as well. That's, that's okay. what I'm hearing, too. 
additional pain. So we've gotten through those things. So oh, we're oh, oh, say. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I was waiting to. Oh, I'm sorry. Go for it. Um, I just had. I'm comfortable with everything that's been listed. You know, as long as we're sticking with CDC. The one I wanted to mention, and we did talk about it a little bit, was the classroom structure and layout, and just making sure that you know, as we're putting more students in classrooms, that we are trying to maintain that distance. And, you know, I've heard from parents that desks are being put face to face. And I, I just want to assure parents that that's, we're, we're not going to do that. And that we are doing what we told them they were going to do. And we've talked about the transparency, and I know you're going to address that. I just wanted to say it out loud that, um, Fourth quarter, first day of the quarter is always an injustice year and, and the transition and um, that and that we can, parents can still go back online. You, just, you said that um, you were moving kids back and forth even today. So right. that there are still options for parents and if they are concerned, they should just, they should reach out and talk to you guys. Yep. Correct on both of those two things. Um, there are a couple of spots where our numbers have, some of our buildings really didn't see much of a change at all the fourth quarter. Um, so their classrooms didn't really get impacted at all. Others that we've had more kids come back, so those class sizes that have gone up a little bit, about three classrooms in the district that we're kind of brainstorming with building principals and staff about, Nathan's been to visit and to look at to see how can we create a receiving to make it work. Uh, we also want to be really careful that, like you said, we're not having face-to-face -face desks and um, use the furniture we have and do some creative ways to look at making space but still keeping it very um, safe with that piece. And then the other part you mentioned is, um, the roles have really reversed. Early in this year, um, we had to essentially cap where the number of people that could go online. Um, now we do have, as more people have come back to school, we have more availability online. So if a family still is interested in making that switch to online because they're uncomfortable with the numbers right now, um, either from COVID reasons or um, space um, comfortableness with things, that's still very much an option. So at all levels right now. I think it's really important as especially as adults, we're going to start feeling more comfortable. You told us at the last meeting that 90% of our faculty and staff have been vaccinated. That's going to make us feel more comfortable. But I think it's important for us to remember that our kids aren't vaccinated Correct. yet. And we're seeing in the news that schools are starting to see spread among students. So um, as we move more students back into the classrooms and as we do have to adjust class sizes, I just want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to still maintain that, that buffer zone um, and keep them as safe as we can. We've made it to fourth quarter, and I think we've done a really good job. And I don't want to just let's let's finish strong and and keep them as safe as possible in the space that we have available. Completely agree. All right, and, and sharing more now. Um, I just just want to say that I'm happy to see the possibility for a return to face to face parent meetings. Um, I know sometimes those are happening in a moment of crisis and to have to be concerned with whether or not you're breaking pro COVID protocols or putting somebody in the building in a bad position to best serve your own child, like allowing this kind of eliminates that on top of what's probably already a difficult situation. So it gives flexibility for right. all involved. Right, um, I would agree with that. And I, I wanna really, I haven't really said this or thought about this too much, I guess, but our parents have been very, patient with us as we've had these unique situations this year. Um, and this is very, everything we've done this year is very unlimar like um, from not having our buildings <laughs> open, not having volunteers in the buildings and visitors and, and people have been very patient understanding with that too. So we, we really appreciate that because this hasn't been ideal or fun for anybody. So as we are able to start to slowly open it up, um, we'd like to be able to do that, especially in those tough situations like you're talking about or just some things are just better done in person. I think we're ready to go. Yeah, no, we got to put it into words. All right, 601. Motion. I'll give it a go. Um, do you want the specifics you've got written on this sheet, or just is that what you want? I thought if we had some changes to it, I'd say yes. But since it's pretty much as, as is, presented. I don't think we need to have that. Uh, I make a motion proposed. to approve the changes to the return to learn plan uh, as proposed, which includes following the CDC guidance. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Okay, next we have on the agenda for JT to give us a review of our certified budget. We already had some, so this is just kind of an update. Our bonus update. session. The second yeah. act. Yes, yeah. 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 <laughs> the, this the like other the, act, second the act. The director's cut. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, we'll so we'll fly through <laughs> most of this presentation because a lot of it we have discussed or, or it's review. So just a reminder what the purpose of the certified budget is. Uh, establish a maximum tax rate for the district and then just a good faith estimate of where our budget expenditures are going to be uh, for next year. Um, this is, you know, if there's any slide that you want to take a picture of or what, this is basically the summary of, of the tax rate. Um, it's based on 2.4% supplemental state aid growth. Um, we're looking at a property decrease, a rate decrease of about 17 or 15 cents, 14 cents. Um, and you can just kind of see where um, those the increase and decreases are within the actual individual levies. So general fund levy going down 17 cents, management levy going up, and then debt services going down. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, this is the district cost per pupil. Um, it's, it, the district cost seems interesting because it's really the revenue we get per student, um, but, but they call it the district cost per pupil. Uh, for next year, based on a 2.4% um, SSA, and then they add some dollars to that again to, for the equity purposes. There's legislation passed several years ago, three years ago. Um, they're trying to bring everybody who district cost per pupil to, to be the same because the look, they're not right now. And so they're, they've added some supplemental money um, to try to bridge that gap. And so that's where I, I have that plus $10. But overall, 7227 um, district cost per pupil for next year. We're kind of waiting to see what the legislation is for the one-time money, um, what that's, what that's going to turn out to be, but that'll be in addition to this. Um, enrollment, uh, we talked about this uh, for the first time in a number of years. Our certified enrollment did decrease. Um, just the pandemic has, has really uh, done a number on everybody's enrollment statewide for the most part. So we were down 77 students um, from where we were last year. Um, so that will play into uh, the formula, general fund formula. Um, looking at open enrollment trends, um, this is the number of students that we have coming into our district. And then this black line is uh, the number of students that we have that are um, resident students that are going out to other districts. So you can see that we have more students going out than coming in. It's about, um, about 70 kiddos. So when you multiply that 70 by district cost per pupil, you're looking at about a $450,000 to $500,000 budget gap. So um, again, uh, I think COVID, we had more kids doing homeschool, things of that nature. We'll see what that trend does, if it continues to widen or if we kind of start to, to stabilize or maybe even bring that, uh, that not those amounts closer together. So from a total budget standpoint, our total, total budget for next year is about $140 million. Um, but looking at just our general fund, we're looking at about a 96 to $97 million budget. Um, from a revenue standpoint, the majority of our revenue is going to come from state aid, about 56%. Uh, the, the blue line is property taxes, about 32.5%. And then federal money, 4%. And then other local revenues at 7.8%. Um, this presentation was done before the last federal relief uh, bill came through. So we just got those allocations today. Um, so that's an additional $4.6 million, um, which is not included in the next, it'll be over the next three or three years we have to spend that. So that federal percentage potentially or will go up um, likely. From an expenditure standpoint, um, the majority of our expenditures in the general fund will be um, toward instruction. Obviously, that's our, our teachers and um, anything that goes into the, um, educating our kiddos. Uh, student staff support at 12%. That's going to be like our nurses, our counselors, our media center technology, um, things that, that support our staff and students. Um, general, administ general administration, that's the board budget, superintendent's office. Um, so it's a, a fairly low percent. Um, compared, to, compared to the overall budget. Um, building administration, that's going to be building principals, building secretaries, anything that comes out of like the principal's office is out of various buildings. Um, business administration, that's going to be business services, human resources, things of that nature. Operations and maintenance, our custodians, our, oper our buildings and grounds department, utilities, supplies for building toilet paper, paper towels, all that good stuff. Um, goes into that uh, purple piece of the pie. 
And then transportation, self, pretty self-explanatory, anything involved in our transportation services. And then we had the AEA flow through or AEA support. As I've said this before, it's just basically an in and out. It's a drill entry in our books, but we do have to record it. Um, and that's about just under 4% of our total budget. And again, this is just the general fund. Um, the little line there at the, the bottom of that slide, as you, as you know, um, about 82% of our expenditures are related to salaries and benefits. So looking at the individual levies, just in narrative form, um, again, the general fund portion of the levy um, is decreasing slightly by 17 percent or 17 cents. Um, the rationale is the taxable valuation, we had tax valuation growth of 3.3 percent, um, but as far as the actual general fund property tax dollars that we need, we only need an increase of 2.1 percent, so there's the, the, the decrease there in that levy. Um, part of that is um, since we last met, um, we had our, our meeting or our hearing with the SDRC for the Boulder Peak and Hazel Point um, allowable growth. They did approve that. And so we do have that authority and we can now go back and, and levy back the funds for that. But as we discussed, that's a big chunk of change. And if we can't really do that or don't want to do that in one full year because it'll drive our property tax levy up. So we're going to do that over a series of, of, one, of one or two years. So just to make sure that um, our, our we, we make our promise to the taxpayers that we're going to decrease that levy. Management fund, as we've talked about this one too, um, Increased slightly by nine cents um, due to the increase in our in our insurance premium, property liability, um, and then with our our one to one um, initiative, um, looking at you know some e equipment breakdown insurance. Now that we have our devices in kiddos' hands and every kiddos' hands, just how can we mitigate some of those the damage to those devices? So um, that's the reason for that increase. Couple fund remains the same, uh, thirty three cents. Board levy plus the voter approved dollar thirty four, which is gives us a dollar sixty seven total, and it generates just over four million dollars per year, and you can see the types of expenditures that we use for couple um, on that slide. Pearl, we talked on quite a bit about tonight. Um, just continue to advocate um, to keep that levy. It, it is, it may seem small, um, but other legislators or, or whatever, but it, it does some big things here at Limbaugh. So um, like Shannon said, it generates just over $300,000 of, of revenue and then provides us with some important projects and services in our district. Debt service um, decreased by seven cents. This is our general obligation bond, debt, principal, and interest. So as our valuation goes up, you know, our, our debt levy um, should decrease which it did. So this is the, the rate, looking at it in total dollars. Um, so just over $43 million of property tax levy uh, for our fiscal year 22 budget. And then as far as who has control over this levy, um, the board, uh, just over 28%. So you make decisions on the, the 33 cent piece of the levy, any cash reserve, um, that we decide to, to do. Uh, the instruction support levy, um, that's board approved. And then like management fund, we make, we make decisions about the management fund. Voters, uh, just over 21%. So again, general obligation, our debt service uh, levy is driven by voters. Our dollar 34 couple is driven by voters. Um, and then Pearl, obviously driven by voters as well. And then the formula is the majority of, of what controls our tax levy. That's, um, again, through the, the foundation formula, which the board nor voters have control over, just formula based. Here's our property tax levy trends. Um, you can see we, uh, after the bond pass, we did um, increase the levy to the, just over 18 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. And now we're kind of on the downturn. You know, we made that uh, promise and projection to, to voters and um, right now we're on track to do that. So next year I see that we will be able to decrease our levy. Um, I think we said to about $17.65. So that'll be the target for next year, um, which again at this point I feel like is, is definitely doable. So there's the trend. 
and then looking at our tax rate versus um, a few other districts here in the corridor, um, we do have, if you just look at the, the tax rate itself, uh, we in Marion Independent have a similar uh, total property tax levy, but th the big difference is they also have an income state tax rate. So not only do they have a high property tax rate, they also have a tax on folks' income um, as well. So when people are doing their tax return, right now, if you live in the Marion district, you have a 2% uh, surtax on whatever your tax bill is. And which that would equate to 50 cents of property tax dollars. So in essence, Marion's tax levy is really like $18.50, if you want to look at it that way. Um, college community does, does not have an income surtax. Um, Cedar Rapids does as well have a 5% income surtax. Um, but even when you put those together, um, it still would be lower than Linmar. But the big key is, as we've talked about before, if we look at the taxable value per student, um, ours in Marion is significantly lower than both Cedar Rapids and College. And so our general fund portion of the levy is going to be higher than most because we're lower on the state average. And so our, our levy has to work a lot harder to generate the same amount of dollars as the other school districts would. Next step, um, we had the public hearing tonight. Um, board hopefully will adopt the budget here tonight as well. And then we have to file the budget with the county auditor as well as the part of Department of Management by the 15th. I flew through that. Hopefully, <laughs> picked up on some things, new things. Any questions, though? Did you have an idea? Um, I know we've passed the open enrollment deadline and we've passed like full attachment at the last meeting. Did you have an idea of what open enrollment looks like for next year? That's a really good question. I'd have to, my eyes go over to Nathan because. Uh, yeah, that was, that was generally over into that direction as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kindergarten, they still have, they still yeah. have time, so we don't really, it's, it, it, if we threw out a number right now, it just wouldn't. I was just it, curious because you showed us the chart and, and we have. Yeah, when's a good time to look at that? Like fall probably? Once school starts, because, and the reason I say that is because in the past we've always lost students out that have applied for our state um, online schools. Well, that's going to be totally different moving forward because we can say no to those and provide that experience here. But yeah, we're still waiting. Kindergarten numbers just still seem low. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the pandemic and just not having open houses and that typical registration process. They have until September 1st to still submit. So we should have some updated numbers, hopefully by fall once enrollment count gets gets there to see where we're at. Yeah, I knew we'd have it by fall. I was just curious because we did that. I just didn't know if you had an initial idea of if we were kind of similar in numbers or if we were seeing fewer going out or yeah, I was just curious I, that was my only question yeah, I don't I think don't that we're seeing like any huge discrepancy one way or the other at this point would you agree with that Nathan I mean nothing that um, we're like oh right okay. that was and, my and I try to approve as many as I can the old one's agenda for the yeah. anyone any else any other questions anybody any questions Okay, good job. Thank, thank you, you for your time and for your effort. Well, thanks for putting up with me. This is <laughs> the final final piece of our journey here. So. Well, good, because we were just about to stop putting up with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's time so to do it, right? <laughs> Quick while you're ahead, is that what you're saying? Well, I'll make a motion to approve the certified budget for fiscal year 2022 as presented. Second. Second. Okay. Any questions at all? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Well, that carries. And make a, okay. Go for it. Make a motion to approve final payment number five in the amount of $22,941.96 to Garland Construction and accept the Indian Creek Elementary Classroom Renovation Project as complete. Second. Okay. Any questions about it? Yeah. Seeing any? Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. On to new business, resolution for easement and setting of public hearing. I make a motion to approve the resolution granting an easement for sanitary sewer service. 
Damage Terry Stewart facilities to the City of Marion on Oak Ridge Middle School grounds for $1 and to set a public hearing regarding same for 5 p.m. on Monday, May 10th, 2021. Okay. Is there any question about those? Discussion? Just get a little yeah, yeah, I can do it quick. I don't know if anyone, if everyone had a chance to look at Exhibit 701.1 in their board packet, but th there's an aerial in there. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, you, it's basically in the ditch at Oak Ridge, um, what they want to do is connect our sewer um, line there. Um, so they would just go under Albernet Road, connect to ours. And the reason the city really wants this to happen is it's more of a straight shot for them to do this. Um, and so for future maintenance of our se of sewer and whatnot, it's, it's less maintenance for them. Um, so they would prefer, they're working with the developer to do that. Um, this is not unprecedented. Glenmark's done quite a few easements um, with developers in the past, not in, probably not in recent years, but I don't know, Barry, if you've been, if Ken, if you've been on the board and you've been through these, but looking back on the files, especially when Marion was growing so much, I mean, I have a file of probably 25 years. <laughs> so anyway, there's not a real benefit to us. It's more or less we're being a good partner with the city and, and this developer. So Any detriment to us? No, this is ground that we would never um, okay. do anything with, um, to be honest with you. So there's really no detriment to the district. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So next week, city. <laughs> we need to have a roll call. call. So if you would take that, please. Uh, Buckles. Yes. Eisenberg. Yes. Lawson. Yes. Maury. Yes. Nelson. Yes. Walsh. Yes. Okay. And it's carried. A motion to approve the early graduation request as presented. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations, Congratulations yeah, yeah, to really. those students. Awesome. Make aye. a motion to approve the fundraising request as presented. Second. Okay. Any questions about that question? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Make, make a, a motion, motion to approve the open enrollment request as presented. Second. Okay. And any questions about that? Some comments. Yeah, okay. All, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, pass it. And consent, consent agenda. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay. I'd like to, since Clark's not here, I'll make a couple comments for you. Congratulations to Shelly Pottebaum, Anna Strand, Barb Twachman mm -hmm. for their retirements. I think there were a few more classified staff as well. Uh, Tanya Gibbs, Harry Malmberg, Diane Reed, Gibbs. Stewart. Gibbs Stewart, yeah. So congratulations, happy for their retirement. Question about exhibits, are we good? Okay, not seeing any. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we are to board calendar. Right, can I ask a quick question sure. before we, with, with that? I uh, was driving down 10th and Tower Terrace the other day, and that baseball complex that's north of Excelsior. Are there some are there some issues with the city with parking there? I mean, if there, there were police officers there, there were lights on, you know, people park right on 10th to use that facility. Do they ever talk about that? Is there anything that we have to worry about there from a liability standpoint? Or I have not heard anything on that specific parking in that area. I don't know if you have, JC, but that's... I have not, and any activity that's happening there is now at the school. Well, I understand that, but it, those are school fields, correct? Well, they are. They're yeah. on their property mm -hmm. at least. Yeah. Because, because quite often, if you if you drive there, there could be 10 to 20 cars yeah. just pulled right off the side of the road in the grass. And I ju there were just some officers there. And I don't remember which evening that was. Me and my wife were going someplace down Tower Terrace and looked up there. 
and saw the light there. So I don't know if the police officers are the ticket people or, or you don't know anything about it. So no, and the city's usually pretty, if they have concerns about parking areas, as we've heard earlier, they reach out to us and talk about things. That's, that's not, one, not, that's not our problem. property per se. You know, it's parked on city streets, I guess, is really what it's right. Okay, then, then I guess we shouldn't worry about it. I just had a question. All right, board calendar. Um, we're on the 22nd. We have a flyer here, April 22nd. All day, Linmar Foundation dine out for schools day. So things are pending, but we do have a flyer about it. So if you have some questions, you can inquire. Um, let's see. High school graduation is May 30th, 1 p.m. at the Alliance Energy Powerhouse Center. I was impressive. I got it right instead of what I used to call it. And then um, ribbon cutting we have down here June 2nd. We'll talk more about that coming up for for Boulder Peak and his attorney. Yeah, and both of those two things, the graduation and the ribbon cutting open house for those two schools, we'll have more information for you um, as far as what those will look like uh, and board opportunities and roles for those days too. But, um, it's, it's fun to get back to those exciting type of things we get to do that we haven't had a chance to do um, in the last year. So yeah. looking forward to both of those. So we do have uh, Marion City Council coming up April 22nd. Is anyone interested in being the council to look at the minutes and that or be there? Anybody able to? I can do that. Okay, thank you, Billy. All right, then we also have the next one. The 6th and the 10th of May. Anybody available? I can do one of them. Okay, and I'll do the other. I think it's just the 6th, Which isn't it? So uh, you want me to do this? Oh, okay, what? did I get it? I think it's just the 6th. I think the 10th is ours. I can do the 6th. And then it's the 20th instead of the 10th. Okay, so I'll do the 20th. It says May 20th. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Anything else that anyone might like to comment about or add? Okay, not seeing anything. I'd entertain a motion to to dismiss. Okay, uh, 622 p.m. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We 